Yeah. Yo k u k i t a n e The mention of Koei Tecmo probably brings a handful of big series to mind, depending on what you're into. Atelier, Fatal Frame, Neo, Dead or Alive, Ninja Gaiden, Dynasty Warriors, and so on, and those are all pretty fair shouts. They're games that are usually a lot of fun to play, and many have left a substantial mark on gaming. But before Koei Tecmo was, well, Koei and Tecmo, back when they were separate companies, they were less known for bombastic action titles and adventures and more for strategy games, primarily historical simulations such as Lem Pro, Liberty or Death, Romance of the Free Kingdoms, and of course Nobunaga's Ambition. Games like these define the early image of the company for their complex and interesting gameplay and goals of historical accuracy, and became some of the defining titles of the early days of Japanese PC gaming. Something a lot of people don't know about these early days of Koei, though, is that there was a not insignificant amount of women working there, no doubt thanks to policies likely instituted by co founder Keiko Arikawa, such as maternity leave and other aids few software companies provided. This led to a very interesting development, however, when she helped to gather together a Small team by the name of Ruby Party and take a bet on one very ambitious project Angelique. Initially released for the Super Famicom but later ported to just about everything, the project was spearheaded by Arikawa with the idea that girls deserve real games made for them too. And so, her and her team, under the name of Ruby Party, sought to combine the concepts and ideas of titles like the Nobunaga and Free Kingdoms games with one big important twist What if you could date pretty boys? That simple idea set in motion the unstoppable train of the otome game genre, one that drives on to this day, carrying dozens and dozens of interesting titles in the luggage and excited fans as the passengers, though this game is maybe not in the way that people think of otome games now. Angelique's ancestry with modern day otome visual novels is more spiritual and conceptual than it is gameplay, given that this is in many ways what it's set out to be the young lady's version of a Koei strategy title, and less influenced by the growing scene of adventure like dating sims one saw on Japanese home computers. But hey, it's on VNDV, so I can talk about it. Oh god, what manner of request did I just open myself up to? Am I gonna have to talk about Melty Blood? So even if this isn't the kind of thing that I normally cover on this channel, I feel it's close enough in spirit and absolutely important enough to the history of dating sims and visual novels in general that it warrants coverage here. And frankly, it's still a fun game in spots, despite its many problems, from the drought of content, the structure, story, and gameplay, and the copious RNG in every step of a playthrough that prevent it from being as accessible and enjoyable as it could be. But it's bursting with charm, interesting mechanics, clever design, and of course, it's got those boys. All of those in such quantity that I think it's still worth celebrating and examining the achievements of Erikawa and her team. Angelique takes place in a far off land, a land with beautiful castles, pretty queens, handsome boys, and a major crisis on its hands. The power of the queen that rules the worlds is weakening, and so the queen's aide, Dia, is tasked with finding possible candidates who could replace her. In the end, it comes down to two students of the Simone Lee Girls Academy the talented and skilled Rosaria de Cartagena, and the unremarkable but nonetheless capable Angelique Limoges, both of whom are isekai'd away from their everyday life to the sacred bird cosmos and given a simple exam to show their ability to grow and manage a civilization and govern as queen by using the elemental powers of the Nine Guardians, some new to the job and some old, who all hail from different planets. Of course, by nature of this game being what it is, all of them just so happen to be pretty boys, totally available for Angelique and Rosalia to fight for the attention of, and ultimately, become close to and harness their powers for the good of life. And that's it! Summing up Angelique's overarching narrative is difficult, mostly because there isn't much of one. If you're playing the cartridge version, the game just straight up opens with Angelique and Rosalia walking into the Queen's room to be briefed on the direness of the situation, the basics of the gameplay, and then boom, you're off on your own to watch everything unfold, with backstory and lore hinted towards in small amounts throughout. The version for CD consoles I'm playing here at least adds an opening cutscene, but that doesn't really add too much. How did the Sacred Bird Cosmos come to exist? Why is the old queen running out of power? Where did the queen and Dia come from? Who are Angelique and Rosalia in their old lives? Where did the Guardians even come from? Some of this is theoretically explained in game, but not all of it is, so world and general history details can feel ignored. But I think the reason for why this is, is threefold. 
First is that it's best to think of this game in the same vein as something like those other Koei strategy games. Despite being listed on VNDB and clearly the origin point for what would become a predominantly VN-style genre, this is a strategy game first and a story second, so it's like many other console games at the time in that the priority isn't really given to anything but the selling point and the gameplay. Second is the world and characters in Angelique are all things you're probably at least a little bit familiar with if you consumed a lot of shoujo and media like its target audience likely did. Angelique and Rosalia don't have much backstory because the former is the self-insert high school girl protag and Rosalia is the haughty rival, the boys are all at their core characters you've seen before, and the world is a loving tribute to the European fantasy lands one often saw in those. Ruby Party knew their audience was more than familiar enough with the whys and hows of what's presented to fill in blanks where needed, and while this combined with the first point creates some issues that we'll get to later, the attention that would have been focused there seems entirely redirected towards making the cast as lovable and as charming as possible. Lastly, I don't think Angelique was ever meant to be just a game. It was a multimedia project. The original title serves partly as a springboard for other works, namely manga, countless drama CDs, sequels, and re-releases with additional content, so those who enjoyed their time here but want more, whether that be out of disappointment, genuine curiosity, or both, would come back for more when the next hot new product came off the Koei presses. And that isn't to say the game here isn't enjoyable on its own. Total honesty, I had never played an Ultimate game before Angelique, so I had no idea what to expect going in and kinda just thought I'd find one or two guys I like, walk away thinking, oh, that was fun, and never give more thought to it all. Well, I definitely fell for one and two in particular, but by the end of my expedition into Angie's world, I found myself loving everyone here. If there is anything Ruby Party excels at, it's creating an endearing cast. From their quirky designs to their mannerisms, you don't need anything more than a cursory glance and one or two lines of dialogue to really get a feel for who a particular person is. And if they don't click with you there, then the way you're encouraged to interact with everyone in gameplay will eventually lead you to finding something that sells you on them, even if not as much as whoever here is your type. Now, to cover them all briefly, Julius, with the power of light, is a noble and aristocratic man dedicated to his work and raised with a strict education. He can come off cold, and frankly he is kind of cold, but he has a clear capacity for love and can warm up with time. Clavis, with the power of darkness, came from a poor nomadic family, traveling around the world with a single mother until he received a magic crystal ball from her sent by a messenger, taking him to the cosmos where he contemplates and keeps his heart locked away from the sadness of being taken away from his past life and family. Randy, with the power of wind, is the resident boy next door, a cheerful and happy dude who loves archery, is a tad bit gullible, and maybe a bit hot-blooded. Lumiere, with the power of water, is the prettier than the girl's boy of the group. A talented musician and gentle soul, he cares deeply about and seeing the world around him. Oscar, with the power of fire, is like if someone mixed a dude from Fire Emblem or Langrisser with your average charming anime playboy. He's loud, rambunctious, and kind of an idiot, but endlessly charming with his way of talking and passion for his work. Marcel, with the power of greenery, is the youngest of the guardians and also absolutely adorable and deserves to be protected. An excited young boy filled with love for everything around him, he enjoys everything to do with nature. Zephel, with the power of steel, is a rebellious and over-the-top guy who loves technology and looks like he came straight out of a forgotten shonen manga, talking brashly and casually with everyone and quick to express his emotions. Olivier, with the power of dreams, is a flamboyant drag queen with an eye for fashion whose past is barely known other than his passion for makeup, helping to make others' dreams come true before he became a guardian. And finally, Luva, with the power of Earth, is a gentle and bookish man who's inexperienced with people, particularly women, because he spends most of his time reading alone in his library. So, there's something for everyone, and while giving general descriptions might make everyone appear as if they're one-dimensional, and, well, they mostly are, I think they're the fun kind of simple characters, the kinds that invoke those happy, fluffy feelings of childish romance and admiration, and you do get to unravel more and more of them as you talk to them and about them with others, from hobbies and interests, loved and hated foods, and maybe even pieces of their backstory for ones who actually have that. The joyful simplicity of the cast helps to reinforce that this is a title meant to be fun, something especially also present in the art and aesthetics. You can tell that most, if not everyone, working on this game is a fan of shoujo media, from works like Lady Georgie and Rosa Versailles having an impact on the overall look of things, and in the way it indulges in the heart-fluttering romances like those of Boys Over Flowers and Marmalade Boy, where one look at a guy is enough to send the protag into a blushing fit. Is it corny? Yes. Is it cheesy? Yeah, that too, but it's all in good fun. 
While not having a background in shoujo and other Japanese media marketed towards women might make it harder to appreciate what's here, as someone who loved shows like Cardcaptor Sakura growing up and enjoys the bright and colorful aesthetic present, I was charmed from the moment I started. It also helps that the writing here is really, really good. Full disclosure, while I am someone who studies Japanese and can read and speak a tiny bit, I am by no means fluent. My opinions on Angelique are based on knowing enough to read simple sentences, and using the excellent translation by Indigo Zeal for anything more complicated, such as major character beats and conversations that go beyond the typical how-do-you-do's. It's a bit difficult to navigate, but that doesn't stop it from being an impressive undertaking that helps to break down the language barrier and well-deserving of admiration. But I will warn you right now that this is not an approachable game if you don't know Japanese or aren't willing to look at a gameplay guide every minute until you get the gist of things. There is an excellent one by Marfisa, which I'll link in the description along with Indigo Zeal's translation, but don't be surprised if it takes you a long while to get a grasp of the game mechanics. I definitely had a lot of trouble playing this until about two months into studying with flashcards and a textbook. One saving grace that does help if you're studying is the partial voice acting in the CD versions, especially if you're playing on the PCFX or Windows 95 releases, which for some reason have more than the later PlayStation and Saturn versions. I am not sure what's up there, but I just played on my PCFX and had a pretty good time with that, especially just because of how dang good the cast is here. There are plenty of notable actors who worked on this, including Nobuo Tobita, Shiozawa Kaneto, Hayami Sho, Seki Toshihiko, and the others, and they all do a fantastic job with their role in selling the characters better than just text bubbles and facial expressions can, though those certainly work too. Man, the art in this game is just fucking killer. I suppose because there aren't that many unique backgrounds and areas here, the artists really got time to go over everything with a fine comb, and the result is a game that stays consistently gorgeous throughout. Beautiful backgrounds, adorable sprites, vibrant colors, and the boys' portraits, oh, they look so good. They changed just about all this for the second re-release duet, which, like, it definitely looks nice, but it just don't hit the same. There is something about the simple aesthetic in the Super Famicom game that's really charming, and then made even better and special. The PCFX isn't exactly a system with a high resolution, being at the same as the Super Famicom, which is already lower than a lot of other consoles, and given that the FX was a system that Special was originally developed for, everything works around this. So while there's a greater level of detail and refinement than an SNES game, it isn't exactly PS1 tier either, creating this sorta chunky, high detail look that I can't get enough of. Likewise, the music here is fantastic. It was composed by Chinatsu Kuzu, who previously worked on some of Koei's music arrangement CDs, as well as in our own solo career, producing experimental art pop? I listened to some of it while writing the script, and holy shit is it killer! It's a unique mix of J-pop, classical, Gaelic, all into something that I've never heard anything quite like before. The best point of comparison I can come up with is Daisuke Atsuwa and Arta Nelico and Atelier, and Yuki Kajiuda, particularly her work on Madoka Magica, though even those aren't quite accurate. Point is, girls got a style, and as someone who's been brain poisoned by secondhand exposure to RYM over the years, it tickles a pretentious part of my brain. Her level of musical awareness shines through clearly here, with the soundtrack being a mixture of primarily classical and rock, both falling and deviating from what you'd hear in game music at the time. Some tracks are better than others, anything more classical you can tell she is more confident in, but it's all good stuff that stayed in my head long after my initial playthroughs. Each major release of the game, Super Famicom, PC and PCFX, Saturn and PSX, and Duet, has a unique version of the score, and they're all good in their own ways, I think. But despite sadly only being in mono, I think the PCFX and PC version of the score is the best for basically the same reason as the graphics. You can tell it's based on something from a Super Famicom game, but just a little bit more upscale. What I wish I could be as positive about, however, is the gameplay, which... <laughs> Okay, look, I'm gonna preface this by being upfront. Angelique is a long game, and not because of the amount of dialogue, not because of the amount of reading, which frankly there isn't that much, but because it's a Koei strategy game through and through, no matter how simplified it is, and that means a lot of time doing the same tasks as building things up slowly. So let me try to explain the core concepts and the basic game flow before I try to get into anything else. 
Angelique is a strategy game in which you are tasked with taking your empty, unpopulated pocket of land and using the powers of guardians to fill it with little dudes and houses for them to live in, ultimately trying to reach a certain population over the course of a near-infinite amount of in-game days, while your opponent is attempting to do the same with the same tools. Of equal importance is building relationships up with the boys, talking to them, going on dates outdoors or in your room, and casting completely ethical magic to make them more interested in you. Because if they like you enough, they'll put more energy into your land when you ask them to put energy in, and if they really like you, they'll involuntarily give your land energy and sap it from your opponent. Get close enough to them, and you can go on special dates with them, eventually resulting in a confession of love if it's past a certain number of in-game days. You only get a certain amount of energy, or hearts, daily to do these things though, and every action costs a certain amount. Talking to a boy or requesting a little bit of energy costs two hearts, requesting a lot of energy costs four hearts, and other actions like using completely ethical magic to make them like you more costs two hearts, and getting a fortune teller reading costs one heart, which allows you to see romance stats for anyone you please, which is usually yourself. How bonded they are, or how much affinity they have, based on how much you've hung out around them, gone on good dates, and answered personal and job questions they are liking, and how compatible they are with you determined by your blood type and horoscope. This stack determines how much affection they'll gain from interactions, and can only be increased through the aforementioned magics. So, a usual in-game week of Angelique looks like this. Wake up and see if you've been invited for a date. If you have, then you should probably go out to it. If you haven't, then go to some guardian's office and either ask for power or chat it up with them. If you got power left over, then go chat with someone or request a little power from them, or go to the fortune teller and cast completely ethical magic to increase compatibility, or check on the relationship status of everyone to see how much they like you or your opponent and gauge how close you are. Do this for five in-game days, trying your best to outpace your opponent, and then the weekend arrives. Saturday, if you aren't invited to a date, you go to your land to check on its inhabitants, read bits of dialogue, and see what kind of power they want which is mostly for fluff and for a particularly hard to get, but very cute ending. Sunday is the day that you get to be the one to ask a guy out for two hearts. How willing they are to go out with you is determined by how much affection you have with them, and thankfully you don't have to fly blind with the odds because you can talk to Dia and get some free dating advice as well as likelihoods of being accepted. Or, you know, you can just save scum or power your console on and off until they accept you because it's all RNG. It's basically a free day to build up a middling or greater relationship, which you absolutely want to do. It's also possible to invite someone out for a Sunday date preemptively by wandering around the park during the weekdays and talking to them, which only costs a single heart to do, but I very rarely saw any of them around. Every 24 days or so, you'll be interrupted in the morning by Rosalia to be told that an exam is taking place, which will grade you two on your performance, either judging the population of your land or who's liked by more guardians. The winner gets another point of energy, thus expanding your routine by letting you perform extra actions, such as the all-important dates at one of three locations. The first, and most infamous for reasons we'll get to, is the park, where you're asked a number of questions about the character you're out with, the current game state, and your personal goals and beliefs as a queen candidate. If you answer all of them successfully, then you get a massive boost in affection, but if you screw even one thing up, it's all over, with either neutral or negative gains to affection. It might be possible for partial ones to give you a positive gain if you're far enough along, but I'm not really sure. The second is the lake, which is pretty simple. You just go there and have a brief chat. It gives a small boost that's proportional to your current affection level and becomes greater the closer you get. If it's high enough when entering the lake, there's a good chance it'll trigger a date sequence where the character talks about themselves or the world and asks you a major relationship-defining question. It's also worth noting that you can go to the lake at any time and make a wish there, which might result in someone meeting you, but I never had it happen. The third and final is just Angelique's room, where you'll be given some random questions you can ask. What kind of foods they like, what they think of the Queen Candidacy exam, how they feel about their job, and this is where most of the world building is done. You can also do something similar for Rosalia if you stop by her room. It costs one heart to do so, but you can ask for facts on or what she thinks of different characters and her personal opinions. Doing this builds bond with her, and while you can't get into a gay rivals to lovers relationship, it does make her less likely to take actions that screw you over, namely taking energy away away from your land, which decreases the population count? Wait, are we committing mass genocide? So yeah, start today, cultivate some land, talk and or cast a completely ethical love spell to spend the rest of your energy, sleep, repeat until the weekend, spend the weekend checking your land and dating, do this until you get an exam, nail it, get more energy, repeat until game end. At its core, I think it's a good loop. It's not deep or complex or anything, and I don't think it literally needed to be Nobunaga's ambition for girls. 
I spent about 15 hours on this game, from the moment I booted it up and started learning how it worked, to the point I got a romance ending and got the full Queen candidacy ending. That might sound like a lot of time to spend doing the same tasks over and over again, but like I said before, this is a strategy game. It's one at least as much as it's an Otome game, so if you don't want to engage with the former, then, well, you don't get to engage with the latter, because it's all locked behind the various mechanics. And personally, I don't mind that, because the overall experience is comfy enough from the music to the graphics to the slightly thoughtful repetition of tasks that initial playthroughs feel less like chores and more like a fun ride to embark on, one where hours can fly away, either by yourself or to have something to do and show while chatting with friends. Trying to play this game super serious and strategic-like is a bad idea, not only because I think it's at its best when you're able to just chill with it, but also because trying to engage with the game on a level beyond slightly bringing engaging vibing is a quick way to get frustrated with its critical flaw... RNG. See, getting to know the boys and getting them to like you isn't really something you can do with a flowchart like you can with modern Otome games, both because... One, this is pretty far removed from those, and two, there is plenty of randomness involved in a playthrough. For instance, smaller personality traits for the boys are determined by six numbers at the start of a playthrough. Two of these are unchangeable, one affects how much they like going outside, and the other affects some responses to the park date quiz. The other four, which determine what answers they want to personal questions, change throughout the duration of the game based on how you perform around them. These stats are all hidden from you and can only be revealed through a combination of trial and error, and gossiping with guardians you're close with and are familiar with the one you're asking about. It's a neat way to add some variety to each playthrough, but there's three key flaws. The first is the fact that some of these stats can make the correct answers to some questions completely random. If they fall into a certain middling range, then the correct answer to some questions on park dates, which are the best way to raise affection, can be wholly random. I have straight up been able to reboot my console, load from the same save, and get a completely different result answering the same way to a question. Outside of park dates, this is more of an annoyance than anything, but it makes going on those a frustrating game of Bishonen Roulette. The second is that this whole process of inquiring and asking questions requires you to waste energy, which never really stops being valuable, and you're not really at leisure to do until the very end game. In my experience, it's easier to forget about going to the park and stick to bombarding them with conversations until their affection is at a decently high level, and then use forest dates to keep raising it alongside love spells to increase how much affection they gain through compatibility, since that scales exponentially for some reason. The more affection they have, the more compatibility ability you can get out of the spell. Maybe it's to prevent players from gaining affection too fast and screwing Rosalia over, since it is a shared pull of 200 points for each character and the cap is 200. I'm not really certain. The third is the sheer number of ways in which you can lose affection by RNG, from the more obvious refusal to go out with someone, but also including another guardian being in the office of the one you're visiting, Rosalia talking to a guardian, seeing another guardian while on a date, even if you're not in a relationship and didn't make any plans with them, them refusing to go out with you, not visiting for days, and probably others I'm not aware of. It feels horrible to be punished simply because Virtual Dice willed it, and like, I get it, the RNG stats and the RNG responses and the RNG stat losses are there to lengthen playthroughs and prevent them from becoming jokes, from you making a cheat sheet of character traits and being able to steamroll for the game. But this is doesn't actually make it difficult. Angelique is not a hard game to beat. Just by focusing on maintaining relationships by checking in, forming new ones by accepting most if not all date offers, and cultivating land, you can get really close to a ton of different guardians, completely screw Rosalia over, and just breeze through the game! All these pushbacks just serve to make the game more tedious to play, and really reveal just how little content there is overall. You get bits and pieces of story through dream sequences of the Guardians interacting, and small cutscenes depicting the Queen talking to Dia. You get to learn a couple facts about each guy by talking to them, and then what? By the end of it all, you've spent 6-10 to 10 hours getting a run to the point where you can load that file a few times to see two or three guys' endings, and in that time, only seeing crumbs of story and character building because that's all there really is. This isn't to negate the quality of what is here, because by god do I love what is here, but rather that due to the limitations of the game's design and its scope, there just isn't much. 
and it seems like this was recognized as an issue, so rather than let this be a short game that one can see everything of in a few hours, the overall pace of the game was slowed to an absolute crawl and everything was stretched thin. If I knew Japanese when I was 10 and played this game then, I seriously could see myself having sunk over 100 hours into it. I would have been excited to learn it in and out and play it over and over again and be happy to see every little piece of new content that I missed before. And like, yeah, this game was good at that when it was new. There are tons of people who grew up with this game and learned every little secret it has, got every single ending, romance every single boy, and I think that's really cool. I think it's amazing that this game inspired a whole generation of women to enjoy gaming, that it really did what Arikawa set out for and gave women a legit whole ass video game they could enjoy instead of the low effort crap that was often pumped out in the Famicom. But as a 21-year-old woman, I just can't dump dozens of hours into a game or a story that doesn't have something going for it for that whole time, and I don't think there's enough here to hold it together beyond a single playthrough unless you have immense patience for tiny bits of content. And I want to be clear, I don't dislike Angelique. For all of its faults, for its repetitious nature, for its lack of content, it is a good game. A solid 7 out of 10 total package of some really good parts because goddamn do I really love the characters and the vibes here. Just like, man, look at this boy. I love my husband. Just as much as I love my patrons. Maybe not the best segue, but hey, I gotta find a way to sneak this in somehow. A special thank you to all of the cool people on the screen. Now, if it weren't for you, then I wouldn't be able to make videos like I do. Like I said in my Canon video, which you should totally watch if you haven't already, your donations make it possible for me to live just a bit more comfortably and afford life's necessities, which I can't be more thankful for. If you like these videos and want to support me as well, then consider stopping by and dropping a few bucks as a pledge. Obviously no pressure to do so, these videos will still keep on coming out and there's no guilt in enjoying them without paying anything. But if you want to help out, it would mean the world to me. I've also opened up a Kohi account if you want just a one-time donation, and I'll still put your name up in the next video if you do that. Thanks y'all, it's genuinely really nice to make this content and know people like it enough to pay for it. <laughs> Also, going to take this time to shout out Bob Sago on YouTube, who put out a fantastic video on Angelique last month that's a great in-depth look at the gameplay, story, and history of it, as well as a bit of Koei up to that point, and their dealings in South Korea. I know even less Korean than I do Japanese, but have been fascinated by their PC gaming culture there from the late 80s onward for quite a while. I mean, heck, it was partly Korean DOS games that got me into making music, which led me to all sorts of rabbit holes, including, I think, encouraging me to get back into visual novels. So it was super cool to see that, and I think you'll get a kick out of it too. Go check that out and give her a sub. All of her videos on dating sims are fantastic. She also did a video on Duet if you're curious more about that port, since I did briefly show it, I just didn't have the time to play it or retour. I really, really wanted to play retour, man. Like, it seems like just a ton of issues I have with the original game fix, but I just don't have the time for it, and it's all in Japanese, and that... I don't know, maybe we'll come back to it in a year or two when I know the language better. Assuming I know the language better by then. Anyway, back on topic. While I can't say that I'd ever look at doing multiple playthroughs of this game or encourage others to do the same, there is enough here that even with its problems, I think it can hold someone's attention through a single run-through, if they're the kind of person who can look past problems to see what's still good, and additionally, what's interesting from a game design and history standpoint. Angelique launched around the same time as Tokimeki Memorial, Konami's seminal and impossibly important dating sim that, in many ways, serves as a fascinating point of comparison. On the side of similarities, both are dating sims made by teams of experienced and fresh developers taking a rich legacy of their craft with them into brave new territory. In the case of Tokimeki, it was years developing heart-throbbing, fast-paced action games that tested players' reflexes and knowledge of mechanics, distilled into a title that required players to make the correct decisions at the correct times, build the correct stats, and understand a new, unfamiliar territory on a deep level in order to succeed. Women. In the case of Angelique, it was years developing complex strategy titles that define entire generations of home computer games, ones that involved deep military and cultural history, and made players engage with video games in a way perhaps not thought possible, distilled into a title that required players to make less complex but still remarkable decisions to build an island into a thriving community, and understanding new unfamiliar territory on a deep level to succeed. Men. 
While I can't speak deeply to how Tokimeki in particular embraces its legacy and redresses mechanics, that's something you'll have to leave to people like Tim Rogers, I can speak to Angelique's fascinating way of taking concepts pioneered over a decade ago of Nobunaga's ambition and turning them into something compatible with its core idea of being a strategy game where you can date men, playable and understandable by young women, and toning them down to a level that isn't insultingly simple but isn't horribly complex either. Military resource allocation becomes hearts for energy, you spend the benefit your land and become closer to guardians, spying becomes fortune telling to keep track of current game events, going to war becomes destroying Rosalia's resources, and so on and so on. There is a brilliance to how these mechanics are repurposed and cleverly designed, then merge with seeming incompatible and completely disparate ones from the growing dating sim genre genre that kept me captivated as much as my love for my pretty blue-haired husband in a satisfying loop of growing a civilization, despite the repetition and my own exhaustion with it at times. While I am probably in the minority of people into visual novels and dating sims that can play a game and disregard their frustrations with an exhaustion of mechanics because seeing quirky ideas executed makes my neurons activate, I definitely think there's something to admire here. But if you're someone interested in this game who finds tedious and repetitious tasks to be a deal breaker, then I seriously just recommend using an emulator and abusing save states, fast forwards, and rewinds to make it easier to see all the good stuff instead of having to deal with it all in real time, with all of the RNG and other quirks making everything more difficult and time consuming than needed. I played on real hardware because it's what I like to do. I like to experience games as close to what they were originally experienced back when they came out as I possibly can, and I mean, frankly, there's nothing wrong with playing games in a way that's, frankly, less terrible. Your time is valuable, your patience is valuable. I'm just fucking weird. If playing games this old and antiquated isn't your style at all, though, then there are some other ways to get that classic Angelique fix. Most notable of these is the manga released about a year after the original Super Famicom release and partially translated into English between 2006 and 2017 by Manga Art. First off, shoutouts to whoever had been editing these intermissions. I fucking love you can tell this group started in the MySpace era of the internet and slowly grew and changed as time went on. There's just something charming about how dorky and quaint these are that I can't get over. I, I just had to mention them. Anyway, given the sparse plot and dynamic structure of the game, the manga is less of an adaptation and more like a new story, one of the same characters and locations and starting place and end goal. Two queen candidates vying for the chance to be queen of the cosmos and one of them ending up ruling, but using those all in entirely new and unique ways to do its own thing. It was penned by Kaede Yuta, who did the incredible character designs for many of the Angelique games, including the original, but is maybe best known for illustrating the story of Sayun Koku, which, if you haven't seen, has some gorgeous artworks in both light novel and manga forms, and likewise, Angelique's manga is fantastic to look at, especially for being her first commercial work. It's very clearly in the shoujo genre, not really breaking away from the style associated with that, but it does it so effortlessly and gracefully that it's commendable, and I think that describes the manga as a whole. It is nothing you haven't seen before, from the melodrama to the simple romances, the rivalry between girls, and some major stakes laying in the background of it all, but all executed in a way that comes together into a very complete package. It's as much for the fans as it is the newcomers. As someone who played the game before reading it, I was really surprised and happy with how little quirks of the gameplay were integrated into the story and how characters were represented and expanded upon, and I can't see newcomers being confused by anything here or needing explanation, because it's all dished out in a really satisfying and captivating way. The only downside is that if you can't read Japanese, the story isn't fully translated. It cuts off at volume 5 out of 10, which was really disappointing to me. No dig at the translators intended. I'm grateful we got anything at all. I just liked the story so much that I just wanted to see it through to its end. But still, at the end of the day, is it worth playing Angelique? While I can't speak for everyone, as someone with an interest in the history of dating sims of all kinds, it absolutely was. To this day, it's an immensely charming title with a lovable world and cast of characters, a simple but satisfying gameplay loop, and intriguing design that makes the game design dissecting part of my lizard brain happy. I had a great time just hanging out with one of my good friends and chatting while I casually played this in the background, both of us amused at the occasional goofy shenanigans happening, hoping dates went okay, and trying to figure out the best strategies for playing the game, and it's in that cozy, laid-back form of play that Angelique's strengths still shine and reveal a really fun and fluffy experience. I just wish I could be so positive about everything here, trying to take the game seriously and think about 
well, everything that's being presented began to make things fall apart for me. The overall lack of content and the way everything is so ludicrously padded to try and hide that from the amount of time it takes to make progress to the ridiculous amount of randomness makes trying to play the game seriously more of an exercise in patience than anything else. Still, regardless of how invested you are in genre history and how versed you are in titles like this, I do think it's worth giving Angelique a shot. It's for sure flawed, and I think only those with the patience for older games are going to even get past the first few in-game days, but if you can handle the dated gameplay and the lack of content, then you'll find a charming, if antiquated game under all of that that, frankly, made me really happy to play even if I got frustrated sometimes. And hey, the guys are pretty cute too, so maybe do it for them?